Hello and welcome back to Season 2 of the Football Code Business Podcast. To everyone who listened to Season 1 and is back, thanks for bearing with us during the summer hiatus and welcome to everyone joining for the first time. We've got some great guests lined up for Season 2, continuing on our mission to delve into the biggest topics from the world of football business, so please do subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode. Today, I'm talking to Greg Lalas, Chief Marketing Officer at United Soccer League. I don't think it's unfair to say Greg is not the most famous member of the Lalas family. His brother Alexi is undoubtedly the most recognizable and best remembered member of the US national team, which competed on home soil in the 1994 World Cup. But Greg was a professional footballer himself, representing the likes of New England Revolution and Tampa Bay Mutiny in the MLS. Now CMO at the USL, he's tasked with maintaining momentum in the fastest growing soccer organization in the world, with more than 125 clubs in its membership. For those who aren't aware, the USL is the organizer of the second tier of men's professional football in the US, so the equivalent of the English Football League in the UK. Having said that, it has huge differences, which we're going to discuss, not least the system of no promotion and relegation. So I'll be talking to Greg to find out what makes the USL unique and how it goes about trying to find its niche and stand out to audiences in an intensely competitive US sports market. So anyway, I'm delighted to welcome the second most famous Lalas to the show. Greg, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I might actually be the third most famous. My, uh, my One of my parents might be another one for all I know. You know, uh, There might be people that know them too. Okay, well, I hope I'm not causing offense anyway. By, uh, <laughs> no, not at all. By giving you that introduction. Not at all. So, Greg, to get started, could you give us the elevator pitch of what the USL is and how it fits within the U.S. soccer ecosystem? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the USL, we uh, are an organization that basically runs uh, and organizes all of the leagues in the lower divisions of soccer in America. So uh, we actually have... Um, uh, seven leagues that we are organizing at the moment. Um, we have two men's professional leagues, the USL Championship and the USL League One. And those are sanctioned at Division Two and Division Three in the United States. Um, we also have a men's, what we call pre-professional, which is sanctioned as a Division Four league. Um, and this is uh, basically a uh, professional environment for uh, adults, um, but uh, the players themselves are not under contract. Uh, we also have a pre-professional league for women called the W League, which launched in 2022. Um, our first season had 44 teams uh, competing. It was really a very successful first season. I'm very proud of that. Um, and that is similar to League Two, which is that pre-professional in a professional environment for adults. Um, and then we also run two, um, what we would call development leagues. Uh, there's the USL Academy, which is basically a reserve league, uh, with about 70 clubs in it that ladder up to the senior teams, um, at one of the other leagues. And then we have something called the super Y league, which is a youth network with about 500 clubs in it that are competing. And that's very much, um, you know, the youth system. Uh, and then the seventh one is a women's professional league, which is in the works. Uh, that is called the USL Super League. Um, and that will be sanctioned, um, you know, uh, as a professional league. In the United States, it's one, two, and three are the professional leagues. Now. So how much interaction do you have on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis with the likes of the MLS and US soccer? Does it feel like it's kind of a joined up joined up effort and i say this obviously in the context of the qatar world cup is coming up very soon and then it's the us's turn right four years after that so does it feel like you have joined up aims and you're all pulling in the same direction or is it actually quite separate because each organization has different goals i think that um the soccer scene in the united states has for many many years been working um in coordination and collaboration to try to grow the game here um, try to grow the industry from a commercial perspective, try to grow the culture of it, um, and really try to grow the number of players, the number of fans, everything involved. Um, I do have regular calls with my counterparts at all of the leagues, including MLS, NWSL, US Soccer, NISA, which is another um, 
uh, the National Independent Soccer Association. And we have regular calls to discuss more marketing opportunities that might come up that we could all collaborate on. Um, but in general, we sort of operate on our own um, and try to do the best we can for our leagues and for our mission. Um, and, and so uh, there isn't all that much collaboration. There has been a little bit more in the past with some partnerships between, say, the USL and MLS, where there were some partnerships and some MLS clubs had uh, development or reserve teams that were playing in the USL. Um, but that relationship is coming to an end after the 2022 season. Um, right now, there are four MLS club, what we call MLS2 clubs, uh, playing in the USL championship. Uh, but after this year, they won't be in the USL championship anymore. Right. It's an interesting one because... If I make the comparison with the Premier League and the English Football League, you know, I'm British as a you know, much of our audience. And there's always that movement, that hope or that fear of movement between the two leagues, right? Every Premier League club does not want to become an English Football League club. Oh, right. And every Football League club is kind of desperately hoping, you know, that's the end goal. Or, or certainly, you know, it's a big step on the way to the end goal is getting up into the Premier League. Um, and that system of promotion and relegation i think is just so embedded in the english football psyche that the comparison i make is um when the european super league was the plans were revealed to 18 months ago and everybody went crazy about it they all kicked off and it's like it's very hard to unite fans of different english premier league teams or different european teams we spend our time bickering and disliking each other and all of a sudden everybody was united you know and and against the european soccer league uh, super league and um, and a big part of that was because it was seen to ring fence the privileges of these few clubs. And, and a big part of that was because there was no promotional relegation. So I know that uh, looking at it from a U.S. lens, it probably feels different because relegation promotion don't exist in many U.S. Uh, sports uh, leagues. But do you do you ever make that comparison and what conclusions do you draw? Yeah, I think that there is a pretty good comparison to think about um, the Premier League versus the, EF, the EFL. Um, when you think about soccer in America right now with MLS and uh, USL, um, I think that, you know, that promotion relegation is just not in our sporting culture in the United States. Right. None of the other big leagues or any of the sports really in the United States have that kind of a thing. Um, and so, you know, it, it's one of those, uh, I, I'm also a, a fan uh, of um, Panathinaikos in Greece, right? So like, I grew up half in Greece. And so I've watched it. I mean, Panathinaikos has never been relegated. But, um, but you kind of, I know that that feeling of, oh, my gosh, we're actually started the season in the relegation zone, we got to get out of that. And like that, that um, angst that comes with that. And there's something really beautiful about that. Uh, for, for us, though, you know, we we don't have um, the relationship with MLS where you're going to be promoted into MLS or relegated out of MLS into USL. Um, these are two uh, entirely separate entities um, that operate uh, distinctly. Um, and so it's a little bit different in that way. Uh, we work really hard to um, present what we would think of as a world-class soccer experience. Um, and what that means is we're... For us, that's we're doing the best we can in our communities to have an impact in our communities. Um, and we have teams in places that um, MLS is not. If you think about the size of the United States, we have about 330, 340 million people across the US. That's roughly the same size as the biggest five or six countries in Europe. And if you look at the number of clubs that exist in all of the top divisions across Germany, Spain, England, Italy, France, uh, Portugal, you add it all up, you know, we have uh, a lot of space in our country for more um, high level soccer and professional soccer to provide to those communities. So um, the culture in the United States is basically that a professional league grows to about 30 teams. Uh, well, that only brings soccer to 30 markets. Um, so there are so many more markets out there that deserve a, a world-class soccer experience. So that's that's uh, that's what we think we're trying to do. We're trying to bring that to more people who we want, who we know, love the game, want to experience the game the way it is experienced around the world, and that's really what we're trying to bring to them. I think it's interesting what you said because um, 
you're absolutely right about the population. The other one is the geography, mm. right? The US, you know, multiple time zones. I don't know how long it takes to fly from LA to New York, but it's certainly longer than it takes to, you know, drive probably across the across England. And that's one of the things that I think is interesting because if you're a club in the English Football League, um, you can appeal to local fans, but you also know that there's probably a Premier League club not too far away. And so they really have to focus on other things. Um, of course, they'll try to attract local supporters and they'll really play on being a local club, which plays a big role in the community. Um, sometimes they will talk about their family run, uh, you know, historical identities. And that is really crucial. A lot of these clubs are 100 years plus. For a USL club you know maybe one you know the kind of top clubs at the usl to what extent are they also talking about you know we're a community club or to what extent are they relying on actually it's a huge country and there are loads of people and you know geographically we're probably the closest you've got to premium sport i think it's a combination of both right um and i think you could look at a club like uh detroit city fc uh, they are in a large market. Detroit is a big city. It's one of the top 15 markets in the United States uh, from a population um, perspective. And, you know, they have a professional NFL team. They have an NHL team, an NBA team, and a Major League Baseball team. So they have all the other big uh, sports in, included. And they also have a USL championship team. Um the way that they are having success in Detroit as a club is that they are hyper local. They are very focused on representing what the new Detroit is all about. Uh, and that is um, expressed for them in the way that they uh, impact their community. They do a lot with their fans. They have an amazing supporter culture. The experience at the stadium is terrific. Um, and they put a good product on the field, uh, especially for their first year in the second division, in the championship, they're actually, I think, uh, going to make the playoffs. So they're having a good season. Um, they, uh, but, but they also are saying, this is the best soccer in the Detroit area. This is the best soccer within a four hour drive because the nearest MLS team is either Chicago or Columbus. Those are both like a four hour drive away or Toronto. That's a four hour drive away. So, this is where you can have an amazing world-class soccer experience right in your local town. And by the way, we represent your local town. We are what the new Detroit is all about. It's sort of gritty and it's it has pride in itself. It's that sort of Detroit strong mantra, if you will. And I think that's a really good um, representation of what a lot of our clubs are all about. How do we represent our local community, but also because of the size of our country, you're not going to have a Premier League team or an MLS team or whatever that is right down the road, you know, a, a 10 minute um, uh, underground ride away, right? Um, it's actually one of the great things about England. You go to London and you meet someone who says, oh, I'm a Watford fan. And, you know, when, when I became a Watford fan, they were in the, I don't know, third division or League Two or whatever it was called back then. So, um, and I remember just thinking, well, why don't you just go down and watch Chelsea? Because that'll take you like 20 minutes to get down to watch a Chelsea game, you know? Um, and that was just, you would never do that. I'm a Watford fan. I'm going to Vicarage Road. I'm going to watch them. I'm not going down to Stamford Bridge. Um, and But in the United States, it would be very much, you know, if someone started a, a basketball team in Flint, Michigan, like a professional basketball team in Flint, Michigan, it'd be really hard to get people to say, I'm going to go to that basketball game in Flint rather than to just drive a half hour and go and watch the Detroit Pistons play. Um, because there's so... Right, and it doesn't have the history side. It doesn't have the history, you, right. You know, the four hours, you, you mentioned four hours. Like, you know, from London, you could, the furthest Premier League club away is Newcastle, and that's four hours. Right, so, um, exactly. So yeah, you got the geography. And, and so there's, so a Watford will play on the history. I... You know, I reckon it's a decent guess that your friend, who's a Watford fan, had family connections to. Yeah, well, I I, uh, I know, trained with who support. I trained with Watford for two months, so and I played in some reserve games. Uh, but it was because a friend knew someone at Watford, and that's why I went there. And next thing you know, I was you know uh, wearing the jersey in a game, and that was it. So, so to what extent does the USL 
talk to its member clubs and say, here are the things that you should be focusing on. You know, I'm talking about the marketing strategies here, or is it really a question of trusting the clubs in the USL to do things a little bit differently, to do things the way they want to do it? You know, I'm talking about, I'm thinking about the Oakland Roots, I'm thinking about um, Las Vegas Lights, you know, who are doing things that could only be done in those places. So do you, what's the role of the USL? Do you encourage it? Is it entirely organic? Um, Do you put recommendations in place? How are your interactions with clubs? Like, do you understand, okay, Detroit City, you know, they're going to go for this certain route this year, or do you sort of see it at the same time everybody else does? I think that, um, I think that's a, it's a really important question because I think it's changing. Right. Um, over the last couple of years, I think the USL has done an amazing uh, job over the last few years coming through the pandemic just to stabilize. Um, I think a lot of sports around the world had to do this. They had to figure out a way to get through this. And when you were um, an organization like the USL, which was already, you know, at that point coming into 2019, had a very good season, 2020, Now you're starting to think, oh no, what's happening? Because when you're at the lower divisions of soccer in the United States, you know, there is a long history of um, uncertainty. Um, But in fact, what happened during the pandemic was a lot of things became solidified and stable. Uh, And so now I think the USL is at an inflection point where it's ready to sort of continue to rise. And a lot of that comes down to how do we start to improve the operations of our clubs? How do we start to, at the league level, support what they're doing with um, whatever it might be, various platforms that everyone can activate against, uh, marketing platforms, uh, products and tools that they can use to improve uh, how they are operating um, and providing the support that they need. When I look at, say, what Las Vegas is doing or what Oakland is doing or what Detroit is doing or San Antonio or any of those uh, teams, I don't necessarily want to come in from the marketing side and say, you must do this. Uh, This is how you need to operate. I want them to express their community and their brand um, in the way that's going to resonate in their local markets. What I think that the league or the marketing group at the league can do is provide them the support to say, okay, you want to be the most community centric club possible. You want to reach this audience. What can I do from a marketing side to understand, to help you understand that audience? Can I bring you more data? Can I bring you tools to analyze that data? Can I provide some efficiencies on your media campaigns? Um, can I uh, amplify what you're doing through the league channels, uh, for example? So that's sort of where I think the USL's next evolution is, is can we as a, as a whole ecosystem of, I think you said 125 clubs, right? We're, we're impacting 200 plus communities with all of those clubs. Can our entire ecosystem be energized and activated so that we become this huge juggernaut uh, in the marketing space and in the industry um, by having that very hyper-local uh, connection, but at scale, right? So that's really what where I think I, I and the league can have our biggest impact. It sounds like it encourages or even demands a lot of innovation, a lot of imagination. You know, if you can't rely on an international audience, a huge, you know, 100 million plus TV audience every week for every game. Um, And if you're competing against other franchises locally, it feels like a lot of these clubs are trying to represent local communities, but they're also trying to represent something more. There's a lot of purpose driven um, action, I think. And I'm thinking about Vermont. I'm thinking about Oakland. Um, I mean, it also rings true of, uh, of Angel City, which I, I don't believe is a USL no, club, but it's you know it's it's a, it's kind of a story that everybody's talking about because um, you know they're representing something more, and that seems very true of uh, of some of these USL clubs you're talking about. Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that I started talking to people about when I first joined the, the, the USL about six months ago was, do we know what the brand stands for? Right? What's our vision for what we want to do? Um, and, and we started, you know, we, it's still a work in progress of that, but one of the things that comes back again and again and again 
is that we want to be as community centric as possible. We want to be the most community centric sports league in the world. Um, and what does that mean? It's, it's an ambition to have that. And but what does that actually mean? To me, that means recognizing that soccer is a sport. Um, it's an entertainment vehicle, if you will, but soccer ultimately is a vehicle for helping people improve their lives and having a positive impact on their community. And that can come in so many different ways. That can come in providing opportunities for kids to um, help for their health and their wellness. It can teach people discipline. It can teach people um, uh, teamwork, right? Um, it can also provide an amazing entertainment option for a family. Um, it can uh, provide jobs. If you, you, know, you build a new stadium, it can provide jobs in the local community. Um, it can provide pride in your local community when your team wins the title. Um, and so uh, what, what we continually say is if we are going to be community centric, we have to have real impact in that community and we have to represent our local market. So in Vegas, it's all about the entertainment, right? They do a lot of things that would seem wild and wacky, but it's about entertainment and they have a brand that you over in England know about because of what they're doing, because you say, oh, that makes sense in Vegas, right? Uh, the Oakland Roots, incredible social impact that they're having locally. They represent um, the town, if you will, uh, the way Oaklanders want to believe that they are. Um, and so you look at the things they do in their local communities from, you know, um, the causes that they champion, the events that they put on. It's all representative of how to improve the city of Oakland, which, frankly, over the last 30, 40 years has not always had the best reputation. But they are a source of pride in that community for what the new Oakland really is. Um, we talked about Detroit similar thing about what the new Detroit is. San Antonio FC, they are very, very serious about their soccer. They're a really good team. They're probably gonna end up with the best regular season record uh, this year. And they represent what San Antonio is all about. It's a melting pot of the um, uh, Latino immigration coming up from Central and South America. It also has the old Texas feel. Um, and so they're doing amazing things as well to represent their local community. Um, and, and it's really about that impact that they're having uh, in, that, in, their, in their markets. It's obviously working, right? I said at the introduction, this is the fastest growing soccer organization in the world. Um, yeah. So, you know, I believe that's by eyeballs and, and audience um, year on year growth. You mentioned data earlier, Greg. How much data do you have? Do you know who these new fans are? Um, be it, uh, you know, race, religion, sex, gender, age, whatever else, uh, geographic location? Yeah, we are we are actually in the process right now of uh, sort of supercharging our entire data um, uh, operations, ultimately. Uh, we have collected a lot of data. It uh, It is not at this point as operationalized as possible. And so that is one of my biggest projects this year since I've come on board. And I have an amazing team at uh, USLHQ working on this to really understand who our fans are, what are their behaviors, what are their motivations, what made them become a fan, where are they, and how are we engaging with them, and how can we engage more deeply. Um, I tell my team always, uh, whenever we're in sort of meetings, I say, remember, our job in our group is to inspire fandom. And you can inspire fandom in so many different ways. It could be an amazing post on TikTok, um, or it could be understanding who the fan is and saying, hey, if we send this person a targeted email, it's going to excite them as a fan. Uh, but we have to know what they want. So we're, we're really uh, digging deep into that to understand a little bit more. Um, to understand, hey, you know, we're seeing attendance growth, um, double digit attendance growth this year. Um, so we're super excited about that. Well, okay, what's driving that? That's the thing I want to understand more. What is driving our attendance growth? Is it that the product on the field is better? Is the experience in our stadiums better? Is it that we have new 
teams that are exciting people more? Do we have better players? Um, are we doing a better job on our social? Are we doing a better job in our paid media? Um, there are all kinds of factors that we're trying to dig into to understand what's driving that growth. So I understand you're digging into this data, you're doing the deep dive, you're going to see what comes out of it. Are there any things you know already? Like, are there any headline stats that you would, or just little tidbits of information that you would throw out there about the audience? Um, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, one thing that I'm kind of um, heading towards is, I saw a stat the other day that the MLS Cup final this year was watched by more people on Spanish language television in the US than English language. And I thought that was fascinating. I mean, you know, I'm well aware. I think it's 55 million Spanish speaking um, people in the US. But even so, that really struck me. I was also looking at the map of where the USL teams uh, are in uh, geographically in the US. And they looked sort of, I don't want to say southern US, but kind of, you know, quite a few of them are, are halfway down. So I wonder how important is the Latino community? And then beyond that, age as well is it, is it quite a young sport i spoke to darren eels uh, when he was in mm. atlanta and he told me that um you know they'd managed to really engage a very young community um in the city so i wonder if that stands true also for, for usl yeah um in general soccer fans in the united states are the youngest of all the sports fans um that are out there if you're looking sport by sport so um but we know that our audience uh over indexes in the millennial and gen gen z um demographics for sure um the latino audience for soccer in the united states has been stated anywhere between you know 25 to 40 percent of the soccer audience uh is latino um i think it's really important that we in in the united states as a marketing perspective understand the difference between the latino audience versus the Spanish speaking audience. And those are sometimes very different things, right? Um, you know, what we do know is that Latinos in general want to consume whatever it is at the highest level possible, just like anybody else would, right? If, if the coverage or the content or whatever is better in English, they'll do it in English. If it's better in Spanish, they'll do it in Spanish. Um, and so, for us, our strategy around that is to just provide the best content possible. Um, we, club by club, we will do things in Spanish. At the league level, uh, we are starting to put together a Spanish language strategy, talking to potential Spanish language media partners um, so that we can understand you know, how we can go toward that audience a little bit more. Because as you say, we have teams in some very, very heavy Latino uh, cities. So El Paso, San Antonio, I'm just talking about the championship, right? Uh, Tampa Bay, uh, there, there's a, a big Latino population there that we want to try to capture um, and engage. So, um, you know, I think if we can do a little bit more on that side in the Spanish language side, I think we're going to do a better job of getting those uh, to become fans of our clubs. When you talk to them from the USL um, point of view, be it website, be it social accounts, um, what tone of voice do you take? Because, you know, typically a governing body can't be as irreverent and um, entertaining as maybe, you know, clubs or certainly fan-based accounts can be. But I feel like those lines are maybe slightly blurred when it comes to the USL. So do you feel that you have to be, you know, authoritative and trustworthy and reputable and to a certain extent serious? Or are you able to um, you know, kind of lighten up and talk a bit more like an entertainment brand rather than a soccer governing body? It's a good question. Um, I have a long history in this because before I was at the USL, I built out the MLS digital ecosystem, social channels, all the voice and tone for MLS. Um, and I also come at this from a journalist background where I was, um, you know, running soccer websites before that. Um, the the culture in the United States around governing bodies, I think, is different than it is in the U.S. Or sorry, in uh, outside of the U.S. You look at what the NFL does. Uh, you look at what MLB, Major League Baseball, NBA, they have huge media properties that they are, um, you know, putting content on all the time. And if they aren't putting content that is authentic, for the fans and the audience, 
then they're never going to have any traction with that audience, in which case that media property doesn't have any value. So um, there's a culture in the United States where a league digital channel, a social channel of, uh, is it's okay for them to be uh, to have a voice, to have a tone, to be a little bit more irreverent, to be in um, in partnership, if you will, with the fans. Uh, whereas I know in the in the UK or in uh, other countries in Europe or in South America, they're expected to be very sort of straight and narrow down the down the middle um, in that way. I do think that's changing slowly. I think so too. I, I, I do. I do think that's changing. I think if you were to look at um... Uh, you know, some of these governing bodies or leagues or tournaments and their social accounts, I think the way that they they speak to their audiences, to their fans, and social media is clearly an accelerator of Correct. this, yeah. uh, is a lot less formal than it was, um, you know, even, even 10 years ago. And I think that the European leagues in general are also looking at it based on the audiences. So like the Bundesliga social channels in the United States are different than they would be in Germany because the audience in Germany for Bundesliga social and YouTube and whatever is going to have one perspective. That audience in the United States might have a very different perspective that's, that's maybe looking for something a little bit different. Um, for us, what uh, we have been... Um, before I joined, I feel like the USL was relatively uh, um, solid, let's say. Um, and I came in and said, let's shake things up a little bit. Let's maybe have a little bit more voice and tone. Let's let's think about what we're putting on our sites to, to be a little bit more uh, in our social channels to have a little more voice. Um, and so we have leaned into things like TikTok. We've leaned into YouTube shorts. We've leaned into reels on Instagram and we've seen success. Um, we had uh, a couple of sort of breakout videos, one on Instagram, one on uh, TikTok um, that were just, it was just about having fun. Um, I always say it, that people on social, especially, they want to know that there's a person on the other side of that or someone that feels like a person on the other side of that handle. Um, and so if we act like the fans that we are when we're on those channels, then a fan out there is going to feel a little bit more of a kinship to it and is probably going to engage more deeply with it. Um, so we've been trying to do that as much as possible. Sure, sure. That, yeah, no, that makes sense. It was interesting you were talking about Bundesliga and English language channels. And um, you think about Bundesliga clubs and their English language channels, and they're really... You know, they're kind of plowing a certain path with their, um, you know, their kind of jokey yeah. social channels. I think they do it more on the English language than they do on the German language. And some people find it offensive. You know, you people say, how can you laugh at this and that and that player and that situation or whatever yeah. else? Um, but the popularity of it and the fact that it's now um, ubiquitous amongst German um, football clubs, I think shows that it's, uh, you know, that's the situation. That's the direction they're going in. And, and maybe we could debate about, you know, that's, what is the position of Bundesliga? It's strange to think about Bundesliga as a challenger brand, but probably when it comes to English language audience, Bundesliga is sort of challenger. So maybe that's something that only they could do. And if Manchester United in their English language channel started doing that, you know, that'd be truly um, sort of outrage. Right. But yeah, uh, yeah, I know it's an interesting one. I, um, Greg, I wanted to sort of look forward a bit and think about what does the future hold uh, for USL? Um I know there are plans to change to a European football calendar. Um, what's the what's the theory behind that? Why was that decision taken? Well, the decision was taken to move to a um, more traditional European calendar for the Super League when that launches. Um, at this point, we are not um, we're not confirmed uh, to move to a European uh, calendar for the men. Um, but when the Super League uh, launches for the women, it would be on a European calendar. Um, in some ways, it, it's it's that'll be done for various reasons. One is we want to make sure that we are doing right by the players so that they have time off in the summers for Olympics and World Cups and things like that. Uh, we want to make sure that they can have as much rest as possible. We also think that that opens up the opportunity to have some of our uh, most high profile moments of the season. So, you know, the start of the season, our playoffs in the best weather possible you know, August, September for the start of the season and then May, June for playoffs. Um, and so, and, and in some ways, I think that will also be, we will watch that and see how that goes before we make a determination of whether other leagues within our ecosystem would move to that. Uh, but I think that what 
that decision is indicative of is this notion that as we continue to try to differentiate ourselves within the landscape uh, of soccer in America, and we um, try to, what I would say, shape the future of soccer in America, we're always looking at ways that we could innovate. Um, and one of the things that I think the USL has talked about publicly and, and you know, that we're seriously uh, kicking the tires on, if you will, is some sort of a promotion relegation. Um, it is complicated uh, and, uh, you know, would require a lot of sort of time and effort to really understand, but we're doing some, you know, some real due diligence and brain damage to understand what it could look like, um, because I think it would be very exciting if, if a soccer league in the United States was to implement some sort of promotion relegation system, it would certainly be a differentiator in sports. Um, it would uh, help us align more with the global game in general, which is something that we also believe is important. Uh, we think it could uh, present some more opportunities for um, exciting games uh, within the league structure, maybe generate more interest from fans or other teams worldwide to look at our players, which is another thing that we're really focused on is, um, you know, we're a selling league and we're making moves all the time to try and move young American players abroad. Um, and could that be another thing for us to, um, to latch on to? Um, so this idea of innovation, looking at our sporting uh, structures and ways that we could maybe adjust things to change things up, um, you know, there, there are lots of things that we could uh, maybe implement. We're just trying to figure out what's the best one that is right for the fans, right for the players and, and right for our clubs. We sort of come full circle back to, uh, you know, talking about promotion and relegation. I, I suddenly feel much more relaxed, uh, you know, as a as a British full hand, you know, this is this is comfortable territory for me. Um, but it would be an interesting experiment. Yeah. As you say, it's not a, a common phenomenon or, you know, it's, it's just not a sort of... It doesn't happen in American sports. something that happens. And uh, I suppose it's interesting because as a Brit, we look over at US sports and sometimes we think, what do you mean you play the whole season, you get the league table, and then you have to do a cup to determine the victor? You know, why can't the winner be the, the one at the cup? And, and, and I think US sports fans think, well, you know, here's the drama, right? You know, the drama of having the final finals be you know if you're thinking about you know nba or, or, or mlb and, and maybe relegation promotion kind of um ties into that understanding that the u.s sports fan wants final day drama yes and but i think you can look at the the playoffs for promotion playoffs in the uk right think about the interest of that game at wembley that final game to who's going to go up right the interest is huge the other thing to keep in mind is uh, think about Champions League in Europe, right? Because that's about the size of the United States, right? So to really crown the champion of that size of a um, territory, you also have playoffs. You go into the knockout rounds for Champions League and you just have, it's basically a playoff, right? Um, so, you know, you have your sort of regional thing where the UK play or England plays here and, Bundesliga is here and Serie A is here and all of that. But then your best go into a playoff to crown the ultimate champion. Um, uh, so uh, playoffs is is a long tradition in the United States. And I understand how Europeans and South Americans just don't quite get it and say, you did all this work. W what's your reward for being amazing all season long? Um, but you're right, you know, maybe if, if a system of promotion relegation could be installed uh, in the right way that still preserves the um, the business interests that have been put in place already, because that's always one of the conversations that comes up is, you know, I'm a, I'm a owner and I've put my money into, I want to be in this league at this level. Um, and so if we can think of ways to do that, then maybe there's an opportunity down the road for something like that. It would be exciting. It would be exciting. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It'd be interesting. You know, the perils of relegation can scare an investor off. So it'd be, it'd be interesting from that point of view right. as well. But it would be exciting. Right. Greg, I will look out for that. I'm interested to see how um, things develop over the next few years. And um, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you for having me. If anybody, if any listener wants to know more about the USL, where can they find out more? Who should they be following? 
Um, yeah, go to uslsoccer.com uh, on the web, um, and you can get to all of our different leagues. Uh, so um, that would be the best way to do it. Brilliant. Thanks, Greg. And thank you. If you'd like more of this sort of content, please make sure you're following the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. All the best. Thank you.